And hello, uh, I am Daniel Dresner. I am a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. I blog at foreignpolicy.com. I am the author of Theories of International Politics and Zombies, and I am ridiculously jet lagged. <laughs> Um, I'm Megan McCardle. I am the business economics editor of The Atlantic, and I'm a little tired this morning because uh, I was out having a late dinner last night. Well, I believe so you were, we're having... We're in good... But it, but it was for good reason that you were having a late dinner, as I believe Yes, it indeed is. it was. Yeah, so um, uh, I believe it, congratulations are in order. It's your first anniversary. It is my first wedding anniversary. Um, the the statute, you know, the, uh, the warranty has expired. We can no longer trade each other in, and uh, we're stuck. Um, but, you know, overall, I think the preacher did a good job. Excellent. Were paper gifts exchanged? That's the traditional first anniversary gift. Um, well, they would have been, um, except Peter didn't know about it, and <laughs> I actually did. <laughs> I did. He got, me, he got me a really nice necklace, which I'm now wearing. Oh, um, that's very sweet. That really is very yes. sweet. Yes. And I got actually got him these font maps of DC where each neighborhood is like written in the shape of the neighborhood and it all sort of fits together into a map of the city. Um, I ordered one like a month ago and it just didn't arrive. And I, I thought it had, so I went to my office to pick it up on uh, Saturday and it just wasn't there. So, um, but there would have been a paper gift. That is a pretty good I yeah. am a, a, a ridiculous sentimentalist. Well, I think, you know, Peter deserves props for actually going exceeding what the first anniversary should be. So, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, the, uh, you know, way to go to your husband and... and uh, yes. Uh, yeah. The traditional thing is interesting, right? Like, it's like an escalating commitment thing. Right, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, don't, exactly. Don't buy anyone to, Just in the first year, you don't know where it's going. <laughs> um, so you find this a very economically rational set of traditions that, you know... Absolutely. In, but, in other words, you don't lock in, uh, you don't lock in prematurely. There's also some new version of... Or I've seen, like, websites where they have, like, a new version of what the modern equivalent of the, the uh, old ones are, but I can't remember what, for the life of me, what they are. I feel like those sorts of things are usually designed by Crate and Barrel to maximize their sales. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should uh, we should start. So um, yes, uh, we'll start with China because I just got back from there. It was my first visit. Uh, I was in Beijing for a whole whopping four days uh, for a conference. Do you have lung cancer yet? Uh, no, no. But I, I take your point, which is the sh truly shocking thing about being there. Um, is, you know, and, and this shows the ways in which I actually think the United States has changed over the last 10 years, is that people smoke everywhere, including indoors. And this, this was just, it was, you know, I, I've, been in the, uh, I've been in the United States long enough and the, the smoking laws have been in place long enough that I was genuinely shocked uh, when I saw smoke everywhere. Um, not to mention smog, because uh, it's ridiculously polluted near Beijing. Um, well, the amazing thing to me was I got there the first day and I was like, this smoke isn't that bad. What's everyone been talking about? And it turned out that I had gotten there the day before they turned, they allowed, like there was some regulation in Beijing that allowed people to turn on their heaters ah. like, on, only on a certain day. Buildings yeah. couldn't turn on. And so the next day, <laughs> like watched this wave of smog roll in. And then when we got to Shanghai, they just finished the Shanghai Expo. Mm -hmm. And apparently China had dealt with this. Yeah by um, just refusing to allow anyone to incinerate trash right. or otherwise it, for months. And so when we finally got there, um, it was uh, like, I, I've never seen anything like it. It was literally like zero, zero visibility. It was burning trash um, day. From the yeah. pollution. No, I mean, everyone was burning six months worth of trash. Right. No, I mean, in Beijing, basically, it's, it's always smoggy, except for the days after it either rains or there's a windstorm. So my last day there was really glorious because it had rained before. Um, and you could really tell the difference in terms of clarity. But uh, no, otherwise, it's uh, otherwise it's it's pretty smog filled. But still, just a, I, I really enjoyed the, the, the trip. It was a very lovely, uh, lovely time. My Chinese hosts were uh, ridiculously gracious. And I've now been ruined in terms of food. Because uh, the Chinese food. I know. Uh, it's it was amazing. Oh God, you know, it's going to take me at least two weeks to be able to eat a Chinese meal here, which is a problem because it's a staple <laughs> of my American diet. Um, but you know, other than that, it was interesting for me. Now you were there for like a nine or ten day trip, right? I was there for I think ten days, yeah. and then like a day of travel on either end. Um, I mean, for me, it was you know more of an intensive conference. The the goal was to sort of have American and Chinese perspectives on world order. Um, and I, I blogged a, a little bit about this, including the fact that I, I briefly contracted uh, what I call Friedman's disease uh, while I was there, which was the, uh, the attempt to try to describe China based solely on my cab ride from the airport to my hotel. 
I really liked that post. Um, <laughs> you know, all cab drivers are in the pay of the AP, right? They're they're like on staff. Yes, exactly. No, I, I figured that. I mean, in some ways, this is a, a journalistic trope of the cabbie must provide good anecdotes. Um, in my case, you know, the cabbie, I, I didn't speak Mandarin and a cab didn't speak English, but his just general behavior, you know, I, I've seen enough New York cabbies in, in, in movies that this guy fit that bill. Uh, I'm not sure he fit the bill in terms of New York cabbies in real life, but like he had this like just, you know, uh, demeanor about him and, and uh, he nearly went uh, batshit crazy on this woman who cut him off. Uh, at one point. On oh, I've life. seen that in New York. Not all of them, but uh, I remember one of my coworkers coming in, literally just drenched from head to toe with coffee, because <laughs> his cab driver had been screaming at someone and then had picked up his cup of coffee and thrown it and not realized the window was closed, <laughs> and so the thing had exploded. <laughs> That's pretty so good. So it does happen in New York, too. It's it's not just in the movies. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go on. No, no, no. That's fair. But, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, in terms of the, the sort of... You know, I was only there for four days, and, and uh, I, I will not even attempt to draw a generalized lessons. The only thing I thought was interesting, uh, the one thing which I just posted about this morning was I did hear the China's director of foreign policy, uh, of policy planning, uh, you know, give a talk. Um, and in some ways what he said was essentially, you know, talking to the old China hands around the room, was essentially boilerplate in that there wasn't anything new that he said. But, it, but for someone who's not necessarily even used to hearing the boilerplate, that in and of itself was interesting. Um, I think the most interesting thing, the sort of takeaway points I had was first, the extent to which China has really now perfected the art of what I call, of what uh, Tina Fey invented the term backdoor bragging, um, which is ways to talk, you know, really nicely about yourself and you sort of insert them casually into the uh, conversation. Um, I, I think the example on the 30 Rock show was that, uh, you know, it's very tough. Uh, Jenna Maroney says, I, I can't follow American Idol because I have perfect pitch, so I can't really listen to the people singing. So, you know, China talks about how it's r ridiculously humble and modest and it learns so well from other countries, things like that. Um, but I think the, the most genuine thing that he said was this notion that the idea that there's any kind of Beijing consensus in terms of uh, a model for economic development is, uh, uh, bluntly put, horseshit. Um, that, you know, while Chinese are extremely proud of, of their, their economic growth over the last uh, couple of years, uh, they in no way think that their model can be replicated anywhere else. And they're pretty pessimistic that they even themselves have a single unified model. Although, I mean, that's like an interesting sort of, it is an interesting sort of bragging, right? It's like, really, you know what the Chinese model is? It's being awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That is essentially their response. I mean, that, that you know, our Chinese model is we just grow the living hell out of everything, you know? Yeah, um, and, like, I heard a lot of that while I was there. Like, there's this sort of subtle, embedded nationalism. What was interesting was the which, power that it had, that meeting with officials had to turn people like me mm -hmm. um, and other journalists who aren't really very nationalistic people like at one point we were sitting there with a defense guy who is haranguing us about um, the uh, the like dual use technology export ban. Yeah. And the example he chose was that they had these Black Hawk helicopters that they bought before this was in place, and then when there was a flood, mm -hmm. they couldn't use them because they couldn't get the parts. And like you know, there's a lot of very liberal people in. in on this trip, yep. there's me and another liber basically libertarian person, and I really hate export bans and so forth. Yep. And like we're all looking at each other, going, "Okay." At the end, so who wants to send Black Hawk helicopters to China? <laughs> and the answer was no one, right? Um, and so I discovered, you know, like the, I started defending U.S. policies <laughs> that, you know, in the U.S., I'm the person who's always like. Well, you know, you have to look at this from the perspective of the Chinese and trade bans don't work and right. all, you know, on and on and on. And the more that they would harangue us, the more I would say, well, right, but the U.S. has, you know, for sort of ignoring the rest of the world and their interests, the more I would say, well, right, but we also have interests and we're allowed to. It's not just that, like, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm fully on board with the notion that the United States may not be as sensitive as it should be to other people's concerns and so forth. Right. But the argument that China was making was seemed to be that, like, they didn't need to be sensitive to our concerns, but we had damn well better be sensitive, sensitive to theirs. To theirs yeah. which was, no, I mean, I, mean, um, I mean, did you find that as well, or was that just... Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the... Well, actually, the thing that I found most interesting was the one country China this guy went off on was Norway. Um, it is very clear that that Nobel Peace Prize rankled a lot. 
So he was yes. talking, you know, about how uh, at one point that, um, you know, China has to learn from, from many, many countries and, and you know, uh, the countries have many examples. But that certainly Norway was completely out of place in advising how China should live its life. As he said, you know, Norway has less than 1% of the Chinese population, uh, but over 100 times the resources. And, and, and you know, it was just, he went out of his way. It was a completely artificial segue to bash Norway. So I, I have to assume that, you know, one of the things now that, you know, if you're a Chinese policymaker, you get to do every once in a while is, you know, insert bash Norway paragraph here. Um, and it was just striking the fact that he that he did it because it was entirely unnecessary. Um, and, and, you know, besides that, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the and some of the Chinese talking points are pretty good, you know, in terms of talking about how the rest of the world is expecting too much of China, but China has made great, great contributions to, you know, global order in the sense of, you know, uh, contributing to UN peacekeeping and, you know, anti-piracy and anti-terrorism. And, you know, in, in some ways, even the backdoor bragging thing, God knows U.S. diplomats are guilty of this as well. So it, it's not like this is unique to the Chinese. In some ways, you sort of have to, I think, put it in context with the problem is, is that the Chinese have to be more careful than they used to be on this stuff because the rest of the region is now mildly freaked out by them, um, you know, and, uh, you know, wants to see uh, the ways in which uh, China can provide security assurances and things like that. And I think one of the more telling things that happened last week, for example, was that the Chinese defense minister went to the Shangri-La dialogue, which was in Singapore, and that was, it was a big deal that the defense minister went. Uh, Bob Gates was there as well. Um, and he tried to sort of say constantly, you know, we, we don't have any, um, you know, uh, aggressive intent in the region. And then in the Q&A got, you know, just flustered very, very badly uh, by the press questions of, oh, if you don't have any aggressive intentions, why are you acting like this in the South China Sea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you could argue on the one hand that didn't look good for China uh, because the rest of the region wasn't convinced. But in another sense, the very fact that they sent him in the first place might be a, a useful signal that they recognize they need to engage with the rest of the region. Um, so, I mean, that, you know, the other thing that I'm really happy about, of course, having been to China now, is that for at least the next week I can talk like a management consultant and say, well, you know, when I was in Beijing last week and then string together a sole group of anecdotes to say <laughs> that this is uh, completely telling of, of China. Um, I, I, this just remind, I, you know, last year I went to a, a McKinsey conference, and this literally, like, every consultant seemed to do this. Like, well, you know, when I was in, insert obscure Chinese city name here, we saw this, and this tells us about the rest of the world. So what is it, so having come away from it, I'll ask you the question that uh, an economist of my acquaintance uh, came away. I mean, you obviously weren't there for very long, but uh, what do you think? How, how much longer can the, uh, the Chinese boom last? You know, I don't know because, I mean, if you take a look at it, at, I'm really of two minds about this. I mean, on the one hand, I really do think they are due for a, a course correction, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, I mean, real estate prices there are just way out of whack. There's a, there's a major real estate bubble going on. in, in And have just started to fall. The Wall Street Journal reported this week. Yeah. Um, last week. You know, they've got major, you know, they have major inflation problems. And then, the, then there's this sort of Barry Eichengreen analysis that says structurally China has gotten to the point in terms of its GDP per capita where you should expect a slowdown. It, it can't continue to grow at the rate that it's growing. Um, so, you know, all of these combined, you know, and not to mention the fact that, that, you know, the reason they were growing at the rate they were for the last couple of years was this sort of major double down in terms of doubling down in terms of investment and infrastructure, which is great, except it's going to lead to overcapacity in, in uh in parts of the economy where, frankly, they don't need to produce anymore. So, on the well, not just that, but things like this massive high-speed rail push that was all the rage when I was there, and um, a bunch of people. I got into a really, really, really long Twitter argument because I was jet lag. I, you know, it, you know, the jet lag is terrible when you go to China, and yeah. especially for me because I'm just prone to jet lag. Mm -hmm. So I would be up at odd hours and like desperately wanting to sleep at odd hours. And I got into this really long Twitter debate with Steve Waldman, I think, of Interfluidity, over whether um, whether it was somehow an indictment of the U.S. that we couldn't do yeah, China's yeah. high-speed rail. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, it's turned out that it was this giant boondoggle. Yeah. Uh, there's big problems with the safety. They're having to slow down the trains. They're having to not run some of the trains. Uh, people aren't riding it because it's too expensive. And the people who it was intended, it was intended to like free up their freight rail system by moving people onto the high-speed high rail system on completely different tracks, but no one's willing to pay to get on the trains, mm. and so like it's lovely. It's very smooth. It's much nicer than than U.S. rail, 
and the Chinese people on our trip were making fun of U.S. rail, in fact, like, which is... Well, let's face it, terrible. frankly, the entire world should make fun of U.S. rail. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Yes and no. Like, the reason that it's hard for the U.S. to build high-speed rail is that we have a lot of valuable real estate... Oh, high-speed rail. rail. I'm sorry. I, I thought you said U.S. rail. Uh, high-speed rail, that's funny. No, he was, making fun of, he was making fun of the Acela. He was like, it's not fast and it's bumpy. And it's like, yes, but upgrading U.S. tracks is really, really complicated because, like, we don't have either the legal fiat, which I think is a good thing in general, yeah. or you know, to, to put stuff there. And also, like, there's a lot of valuable real estate there. Right, and right. So it's a lot harder to just rip stuff up than it is when there's a bunch of peasants and you can move them to equally yeah. um, or better, to an equal or better situation for very little money. And, like, also China, there's a lot of eminent domain abuse and, you know, there's a lot of complaints about how they handle it. So in general, like, I was, I was defending this, but now it just turns out, like, the guy, the rail minister, who we heard talk mm -hmm. in this hilarious, like, unique to China thing where you go, not, I think probably in other, like, Asian communist countries, it's common as well, but you go and they literally just, like, read you lists of statistics for an hour. Yes, they can go yeah, on for yeah. longer than that. Oh, that must and be then, fun. And then they're like, we'll have 10 minutes for Q&A, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> so he's just sat there, I mean, he, you know, stuff that he could have handed out easily, he'll just read it. <laughs> and that that will be the end of his remarks. It's just you know how like how much rail they've laid, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so we went through this, and it turns out this guy has embezzled um, something like a squillion dollars from the system, which is one of the reasons that I cost overruns and like the. Yeah. Um, and my take is that a couple of things: its banking system is totally inadequate to a modern economy. Yeah. And yeah. Actually, kind of terrifies me. Um, well, the other thing is, is that the you know the, the banking sector is one of the major tools through which the Chinese government can try to you know prime the pump, and so right and and, and in, you know control the economy. So the notion they're going to liberalize that anytime soon is is a uh, uh, chimera, I guess would be the way to put it. I mean, to finish the thought, I, there are a lot of reasons reasons why I think China is due for a course correction. That said. I don't think that's necessarily going to really slow down China's inevitable rise because the, the, the other fact is China is a continent-wide economy and there's still lots of room there for sort of intensive development, um, you know, in, in a way that, that uh, could lead to growth even though it might be inefficient growth, I guess would be the way to put it. Uh, much in the same way that the U.S., I think, developed, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So, you know, China is a reality, as an economic great power. That's not going away anytime soon. That said, I do think there's going to be a bubble that's going to pop and is going to slow them down for a couple of years. Um, and I wonder what happens when that happens. Because yeah. Because they're really not, I mean, what you, the, the sense I really got when I was in China, it, which I guess you sort of already should have known, it's not a blinding insight, but it really drives home the fact that there is... For most Chinese citizens, I think, although we didn't talk to a lot of them, and the people, you know, the people we were most sort of intimate with were members of the Communist Party, but yeah. um, I do, I do get the sense that realistically, like the Chinese government has cut a kind of grand bargain with its citizens, which is yeah. that we're going to be anti-democratic and we're going to restrict your life um, in annoying ways, but we're also going to deliver eight to ten percent growth every year. Well, and. I that's a that's a deal that people have been willing to take. What happens if they don't deliver the eight to ten percent growth? Well, I think you're starting to see what they're going to do, which is you know China has doubled down on its coercive apparatus over the last six months. I mean, you can argue this is part of a longer trend, but you know, particularly the Arab Spring has, I think, it is safe to say, spooked the Chinese like you wouldn't believe. Um, you know, and they're dealing with ethnic, you know, there are ethnic riots breaking out, for example, in Inner Mongolia over the last two weeks. Um, you know, I, I have no doubt that the Chinese coercive state, I mean, Frank, Frank Fukuyama makes a great point here, which is to say that, um, you know, democracy on the whole has many, many advantages of authoritarianism, but the Chinese version of authoritarianism is far superior, for example, to the, uh, to, let's say, the Arab form of authoritarianism, and it's superior in all form, you know, all aspects of the state, including repressive coercion. So I think the Chinese state can hang on even if there is low, you know, lower rates of growth. It's just going to look much, much more, you know, uh, brutal, I guess, in that in that respect. Um, so I, I think I don't think the Chinese state is going anywhere. I guess, or this version of the Chinese state is going anywhere. Would be the way well, I think it. the question you have to ask, though, is at what point does the crackdown and the coercion start to itself interfere with the economic growth that they need to deliver in order to keep the social pact? Because you know they're I think that's the, the in, inner Mongolia. It does, I mean, I don't want to say it doesn't matter. Obviously, yeah, it matters yeah. a great deal to the inner Mongolians. But there's nothing. There's no real modern economy there. It's still basically 
you know, agrarian subsistence. I think for that so, to happen, it would have to be a situation where the unrest would affect, for lack of a better way of putting it, the global supply chain. Um, you know, I mean, the interesting thing about about the way, you know, things are working in China is that, you know, they're an, an integral part of the global production chain. And it's if that production chain gets disrupted, uh, then you're going to start to see, you know, foreign investors react, uh, you know, in a different way, and it, which could, you know, then lead to a, a negative feedback. Um, I don't know if, if unrest would ever affect those kinds of places, because if, if particularly if growth, you know, slows down, it's going to be the people that have jobs that are, you know, that, at those places that are going to be the ones that probably won't protest because they're just happy they have jobs. Um, but that said, you're, I mean, you're right. We, if, if we've learned nothing from the last six months, it's learned do not predict what will happen in repressive regimes if there are protests. So, uh, you know, th there are ways in which the Chinese system could falter. But that said, if I had to put a bet down, uh, I, I would bet that the Chinese system will handle things, you know, let's say as well as the Saudi one has, relatively speaking to the rest of the Middle East. I think the Chinese one can handle uh, a larger amount of unrest than they're coping with now and still manage not to disrupt the global economy. But in a way, I can make the argument that the Saudi regime handles this the same way the Chinese have, right? Yeah. They have certainly kept a lid on their own social problems way better than, I mean, they've been more successful autocrats, as you say, than right. any other regime in the Middle East. Yeah. But the reason I, you might argue that they have been able to do that is that they have Aramco, and they are handing out, what is it Well, now? they have wads of, I mean, 120 not, billion, yeah, yeah, no, they have... It's not a ton of money, but it's it's like five thousand dollars a year. Yeah, to no, they, the, to they any increase the salary. Increase, I mean, they, they, with salary increases, they they increase social spending. You know, they, I mean, they they had the cash on hand to res, to to buy off dissent rather than repress it, which is like, I mean, the the, the Chinese complication on this is that, uh, you know, China's sitting on a lot larger set of currency reserves. The problem is, is that they're dangerous to them if they try to translate the dollars into domestic spending. Right. Um, uh, it leads to greater inflation. Um, but that said. You know, China can do this, you know, reasonably well also. Um, there's also the danger that they tank the dollar and then their dollars aren't worth anything anymore. <laughs> but well, okay, this, this actually is a nice segue, though, because, it, you know, the, the concerns are, well, uh, you know, one of the questions that came up was about, uh, uh, you know, attitudes about U.S. debt. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the director of policy planning had some fun tweaking, you know, the fact that the U.S. Seem, couldn't seem to, uh, decide on increasing the debt ceiling and that it would be nice if that was addressed and uh, particularly the long-term U.S. fiscal picture, which, you know, is uh, gives rise to a post that I wrote last week. Um, and you watch the financial markets a little more closely than I do. And this is something that I do not understand because, you know, for a long period of time with the when the Obama administration sort of engaged in the massive Keynesian stimulus, you know, there were a lot of, of conservatives who said this will lead to inflation um, and, and skyrocketing interest rates because we're borrowing so much. And, you know, Keynesian advocates could legitimately point to the way markets responded by saying, yes, this is why interest rate yields are so low and why the, uh, you know, the dollar is, relatively speaking, kept its, its value, hasn't plummeted uh, that much. And I thought that was a, a fair, you know, repose to that. Um, well, now we've got a lot of people claiming that if we don't have an agreement on the debt ceiling, you know, there will be, you know, massive devastation, you know, financial markets will panic, uh, dogs and cats will live together, et cetera, et cetera. And yet... At least so far, financial markets have not priced in any kind of risk, it appears, from a failure to make an agreement on the debt ceiling. Despite the fact that Moody's has been warning that, that you know, this is not likely to happen, markets haven't freaked out yet, and I don't understand why. So as, as the, the, the guy leading the charge, making fun of what he calls the, the invisible bond vigilantes, has, of course, been New York mm -hmm. Times columnist Paul Krugman, mm -hmm. um, who has been pointing out that interest rates are incredibly low right. and that this signals that the market is just not worried about our level of debt. Right. As Tyler Cowen has pointed out, he is completely inconsistent on this because he's also been banging the drum about like the disaster that is going to follow if the debt ceiling Right, is exactly. And this is what I don't um, yeah. My own take on this is that the markets are quasi-rational. Um, <laughs> with the markets, it's not that, you know... Can, can you, you say can that in a Dr. Evil voice? They're quasi-rational. <laughs> quasi-rational. Quasi-rational. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 my take is, is this. The markets think we're going to get it together. They just don't believe that... What they believe is either that we're going to raise the debt ceiling or that we are going to prioritize... We're going to cut stuff before we default on our bond obligations, which is all they care about. They do not care... Like the number of people who've been trying to argue that bondholders care if we default to Social Security recipients, they don't. They don't care. 
at all, mm -hmm. like except insofar as they think that that may trigger some political crisis um, that will eventually lead to default. But they do not, you know, per se care whether we cut through security checks or not. Um, and I don't think that's actually unreasonable. I mean, I think if I were Obama, what I would do um, if the Republicans refused to raise the debt ceiling is I would say, okay, not mailing any social security checks next month, um, and then wait for the, the GOP to fall all over themselves to cave. Mm -hmm. um, because there's no way, or I would say, I'm sorry, we're not paying military salaries. Yeah. We just don't have the money, right? I would pay something, and this is like classic budget gimmicks. Every You may have noticed that every time, it happens in companies, happens in local government, mm -hmm. every time they cut the budget, uh, suddenly arts funding and like gym get cut they don't cut, say, one librarian, et cetera. They cut the most visible, sort of heart-rending thing that they can um, yeah. in order to, to force people to roll back the budget cuts. Uh -huh. And so that's what I would do if I were Obama. I mean, the problem is it could backfire, right? Like, yeah. You could, you could get this, the I mean, guy who gets the blame. Politically, isn't this the big, like, it, it is literally the $64 trillion gamble, which is which side gets blamed if, in fact, there is a failure to agree? And what, what the one thing that bothers me is that it really seems that both sides seem to... Uh, Think that the other guy is going to get blamed? Yes, both sides. My my whole like I have a, a large extended metaphor about uh, what's going on with the budget right now, mm -hmm. which is that both sides know that there is a big reckoning coming and that something's going to have to be done. Yeah. So all they're doing, but they don't want to be the guy to do it. So all they're doing now is they're strategically position, trying to strategically position their programs mm -hmm. so that when the crisis hits. Rather than doing something about it early, which is the sensible, normal thing to do before you end up in some sort of desperate crisis, um, right? It's much less costly to do it if you do it early. But they don't want to do it early. Um, it's painful. Your voters yeah. won't like it, et cetera. So what they, what all they're doing is positioning themselves for the crisis, positioning their programs for the crisis. What they're trying to do is make it so that the other side has to bear um, as much of the burden as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem with that, so right, you pass a big new health care entitlement, which means that it's going to be harder to cut spending and you're going to have to do more with taxes, et cetera. Yeah. The problem with this, I, I liken it to like in, in the game of chicken, the classic game theorist advice is the way that you win a game of chicken is that you rip the steering wheel off and you throw it out the window. Right. Because then the other guy knows that you can't turn. Yes, except if It does not, however, tell you... Uh, what to do when the other guy has read the same book, and as you are throwing the steering wheel out the window, you look up to see that the other guy has just tossed his out. Yes, the problem is, is, is that the position that we're in. Simultaneously throwing out the steering wheels, is, it does lead to the worst outcome, it leads to a pretty bad outcome. So I think uh, that's what we're doing. Yeah. But, um, but why aren't the markets? Because I think that they think that ultimately, because we have in the past, ultimately we have gotten it together at the last minute and done something. And I think that they're not completely wrong about this, but I do think that what both sides really don't understand is that if they let this happen, mm -hmm. it will be worse for them immediately, right? Because if we suddenly can't borrow money, yeah, which is what would happen if we didn't pay, you know, if we if we defaulted on anything for more than a day or two. Well, there is, has, we have defaulted in the past when the computers broke. Right. I mean, there so, is there is another argument out there which says that it actually doesn't matter as much as people think it does because even though we won't be on, you know, in, in other words, it, so long as this is settled a couple of days afterwards. You know, it won't be that big of a deal. And furthermore, in some ways, our biggest creditors still need to buy up American dollars, not because uh, they want to earn interest, but because they're trying to keep their own currencies, um, you know, relatively in control. So, for example, the argument, you know, I, I have heard this argument made that the Chinese are going to still continue to buy, you know, script or whatever else, you know, is being issued uh, uh, instead of debt because their concern is not so much the rate of return. Their concern is the one appreciating in value. Um, I, I don't know. Look, the Chinese do have to buy American dollars, yeah. although they're actually slowing down a lot yeah. on their dollar purchases already. That's interesting. So, um, but second of all, like, yeah, they do have to buy American dollars. They do not have to buy American treasury bonds. That's there are true, other yeah. things they can put that money in. Yeah, and no, that's so a good point. so I, I find that, like, maybe, right, if we default for two days, the Chinese aren't going to care. Yeah, yeah. Um, if it's really, like, a technical thing. Right. But I think markets will care. They will discount it because what it will show people is that there's no sheriff in town. See, my concern... Is that, like... Yeah. The political process has become so dysfunctional that the American government is willing to default for, like, functionally no reason. I mean, my concern is, is that the, the paradox of this is that I actually think both sides want markets to free... In other words, the markets freaking out would actually give them somewhat greater political cover to make a deal, um, you know, uh, to be able to say, look, 
you know, if we don't do this, markets will melt down. Um, you know, think about what happened the first time TARP failed in the House. Um, you know, the Dow Jones dropped 800 right. points that day. That was enough to propel finally TARP to get passed, even though it was, you know, it's, it's still ridiculously unpopular. At least in the heat of the moment, it got through. I, in some ways, it's almost like both sides want that to happen, except, of course, that's really bad if that happens. Um, and, well, and, and in this case, what it means is that the bond market would be freaking out, and freaking out means that they drive your interest rates up. Right, exactly. So, so I, what that would mean is that to close the gap, Suddenly, you know, if we if we do something now that's reasonable, slow, et cetera, like, you know, it takes a while to phase in, the markets are fine with it, mm -hmm. et cetera. But if you have to do something quickly at a point when your interest rates are rising, that means that the tax bite and the spending cuts have, have to, to be, be greater, greater than yeah. they otherwise would. Yeah. No, that's um, the problem, which is by doing this, by waiting for the markets to respond, you're actually creating a permanent hike in the cost of solving the problem. So, yeah. I, I mean, exactly. That, that it's not a significant, uh, it's not an insignificant problem. Um, all right, so moving on from that uh, depressing assessment and, and hoping that eventually the, the rational part of the quasi-rationality uh, kicks in, um, we should uh, we should talk, there's going to be a GOP debate tonight, I believe. Uh, is that correct? Yes. All right, uh -huh. so this is, so all the major players are going to be there, except for Sarah Palin, uh, if she runs, which... I'm now on the fence of if she's going to run it. As I said, I think her primary motivation is spite. So if I, my prediction is if Bachman does well in this debate, she will run. But that's a whole separate thing. Um, I think that it's, it's crazy that she's gotten out of the polls saying that, like, she can't possibly win and that, like, other Republicans are, 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 are at this point, I think, a pretty decent shot against Obama. And Palin, you know, like, I, I'm pretty disenchanted with the Obama administration. It's not likely that I would vote for them again. But if Sarah but if Palin ran, I would go and vote for Obama. Right, exactly. No, I actually don't think Sarah Palin could win the general election. Um, but I'm not even sure she could win the nomination at this point. I mean, they, they, because it'll be interesting, right? Because you remember the, the 2004 uh, Democratic primary process. Yeah, when Howard Dean, everyone thought Howard Dean was going to win and then he flamed out. Well, I, the, but the thing was, what was interesting is that, like, at Iowa, and you looked at, when you polled people about their decision process, my understanding is that what they said is they were trying to pick someone who could win. Right. And so their, the reason Kerry got the nomination was not that anyone liked him. It was they were the, the, a, lot, a bunch of fairly radical, you know, not radical is not the right word, but you know what I'm talking about, the, the, yeah. the, the, the really hardcore party. The hardcore party, party operatives, yeah. Um, the, those people were all like, he's... You know, a military dude. You, you, you Republicans love that crap. We'll totally <laughs> nominate him. Of course, it backfired in all sorts of ways. Well, I mean, um, it, because they didn't understand that things like the Winter Soldier yeah. stuff were not going to endear him to the the military loving. Um, and then they exacerbated the problem with reporting for duty. And um, I mean, but, do you th I guess the, the, this leads to two questions. The first is, is that. You know, Iowa might be a little different for the Republicans than for the Democrats. Is a much right. No, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Is actually like, does that happen for the Republicans, or do they just decide to send a giant screw you to uh, to the rest of the American public? Well, the one thing is, is that remember, I mean, Bachman it, it plays particularly strong in Iowa because she's from there, um, and also, you know, everything I've read suggests that she's actually, you know, really, be, she's actually been serious about building a ground game there in a way that that is the exact opposite, by the way, of Sarah Palin and. and uh, in that sense. So, you know, she might actually come away relatively strong from there. And also, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, the 2004 example you're talking about is more an anomaly, or it, it might be more consistent for the Democrats, but think about who in the Republicans have done well in Iowa. Um, you know, it's always the, the, I mean, Huckabee won in 2008, correct? I don't remember. I think Huckabee won it in 2008. Um, you know, I, if memory serves, Pat Buchanan did well there. Although and I, yet, who took, you know, who won the primary process? It was John McCain, who, right. for all of my dislike of many of the things he did, I was not a John McCain supporter. Yeah. Um, is like basically a centrist, boring kind of guy. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, insofar as Obama is centrist, right? Like, right. he's a mainstream candidate. Yeah. He's definitely, you know, not particularly orthodox, et cetera. And I think that, in fact, Obama is actually much more of an orthodox Democratic candidate then I think McCain was an orthodox Republican candidate. And so, like, you know, we've been hearing a lot about how the Tea Parties are going to just, you know, they're so partisan and they're just going to destroy everything. 
And yet the last time we had a presidential election, admittedly, before the Tea Party movement became big, but still these allegedly incredibly rapidly partisan Republicans nominated someone who was basically pretty electable. I mean, I think um, in, in some ways, I think this, de I mean, this depends on a couple of things. The first is, you know, I mean, it's always, and you know this, it's, it's turnout. I mean, the one thing that you could argue that the Tea Party, you know, movement might have more than any other group is that they, all, those people are going to vote um, in primaries. And so the question becomes, you know, will that push them forward. First of all, will the, in some ways, I think it's almost a race to see which, whether the sort of, mo, you know, more mainstream Republicans, you know, Main Street Republicans, uh, you know, a, a develop a consensus about which candidate they're going to back versus whether the Tea Party develops a, you know, consensus approach about which candidate they're going to back. Um, so let's say, for example, that Bachman becomes the consensus Tea Party candidate, but you still have, you know, Paul Lenti, Romney, I don't know, maybe Huntsman gets in the race, and I, I can't think of someone else at this point. Gingrich, I think. <laughs> oh, no, really. He's just an amusement at this point. Uh, Anthony Weiner of the Republican Party. <laughs> oh, that's, that's that is, I think that might be the most damning thing said about Newt Gingrich in the last week. Um, he's, you know, uh, he's just a train wreck, and like you can't stop looking at it, but you, you don't want to. It's terrible. <laughs> um, you know, in, in other words, if, if the establishment is still split, and as a result, that leads to, you know, uh, the Tea Party candidate winning more primaries at, at the outset, that could, you know, that could lead to a, a trigger effect where they might actually win the nomination. But we don't know. And, and I think part of this is because also, correct me if I'm wrong, Repu the Republican primary system is much more winner-take-all than the Democrat one. I don't know. Okay. I, 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 I confess I'm not enough of a sort of political operative. This is always the set of knowledge that we remember, you know, every election year and then probably forget the year after that. So, uh, but I mean, I guess my question is, is there anything, are you going to watch the debate tonight or is there anything, you know? I am. Okay. You know, I'm going to watch it and blog about it. Honestly, I, I floated a proposal on Twitter a couple of weeks ago um, that I think, honestly, at this point, I think I might support Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, for president for life, if we just don't have to report any more of these <laughs> primaries, but um, I don't think that's going to be a, a position. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to report on all of these things. I've been already, you know, I wrote my first kind of um, election post mm -hmm. the other day where I reported on Tim Pawlenty's. Um, oh, yes. There's really yes. No, other, no, no other way to say it, but insane proposal to make the United States uh, gross domestic product grow at a real rate, which is adjusted for inflation, of 5% a year, as opposed to the 3% that's average and the 2% that we've been having. Um, and now it's not entirely right. Like we could totally, Tim Pawlenty could get elected president and we could see 5% annual growth for a couple of years. That's entirely plausible. I'm not saying it's the most likely outcome. I have no idea. Yeah. That could totally happen. But it wouldn't happen because Tim Pawlenty did anything. Right. It would happen okay. because yes. we've been growing really okay. slowly, yeah. and we would be reverting back. It wouldn't be like his magic, awesome tax cut and deregulation plan. Yeah. Um, and and also, you, you know, can't have a you can't have a plan based on the magical assumption of we are going to grow at a rate that exceeds what the post-war economic growth rate has looked like for the last 60 years. Well, and not only just for a couple of years, we're going to do that for 10 solid years. He said we're going to do that for 10 years? Yes, yeah, so he's just crazy. And he's like, well, look, it would generate so much tax revenue. And you're like, yes, it would. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, it would also generate a lot of tax revenue if we got the ferries to drop up bags of gold. So this, <laughs> is, basically, good... this is basically the Tim Pawlenty free pony plan. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's the rainbows and magic ponies okay. uh, plan for the American economy. And, of course, it's, and you know, the thing is, like, the problem is, now that I've criticized this, I'm going to have to criticize all of the wackadoodle stuff that uh, Barack Obama is going to claim mm -hmm. um, for his economic policies. Yeah. And I'm going to have to spend the next, you know, two years as everyone launches these like ever more unrealistic. I mean, the problem, the thing I really fear is that Tim Pawlenty has set a bar here that now everyone else is going to have to leap over. <laughs> where like they're going to have to come up with some equally crazy and implausible thing that most people won't know is crazy and implausible because most people don't study economics. Yeah. And so uh, it's gonna the only be, the only way I can cheer you up on this is to reassure you that it's not two years. It's only I believe uh, eighteen months. It's only 18 months. Um, That's I, I will hold on to that. Well, it makes you feel any better. You know, what I'll, of course, be looking for is I, I invented a new award uh, for this campaign season called the Trumpy. Um, uh -huh. And this is for what I call assertive ignorance in world politics. 
So what was what did Trump do to uh, to generate the first Trumpy? Trumpy uh, Don, uh, Donald Trump argued that really uh, what you know the way he could solve the U.S. economy um, was to send the right negotiator in the room uh, with with <laughs> OPEC to lower lower oil prices and send the right negotiator in the room to China to get them to uh, appreciate their uh, the the, the renminbi. Uh, oh, did we not have a good negotiator? Is that our problem? That was our problem. Apparently, it wasn't that there, these are structural issues that are, you know demonstrate the limits of U.S. power. It's, in fact, that we just haven't put the right guy in the room. Uh, so, you know, th th I had to award him the Trumpy for that. And, uh, you know, already we've had two others earn this. Uh, Herman Cain earned one for uh, not having any clue what the right of return was, uh, you know, in the Middle East, and yet asserting... Uh, you know, on, on uh, the, the Fox News Sunday that, that that should be an issue that should be negotiated between the Palestinians and the Israelis, when in fact there's no way the Israelis want to talk about that. And then um, Paul Ryan demonstrated that in his first foreign policy speech uh, in terms of assuming that uh, the U.S. Uh, could demand more from its allies in terms of uh, things like defense uh, contributions, which admittedly is something we would like to have. I mean, even Bob Gates has said that. But the notion that somehow that will be the solution to our policy problems is... is you know, borders on fantasy. So I'll be looking for, you know, the key thing about this to earn a Trumpy is not just to demonstrate ignorance in foreign policy, but to demonstrate that ignorance and yet still cast a demeanor that indicates you actually know what you're talking about. Right, and, and to build a policy. Right, right. So words, I, I have no problem, and let me be clear with this, I really have no problem with candidates saying, I don't know. Um, I actually find that refreshing on, on foreign affairs because let's face it, it's a really complex world out there. But a, a you know, a foreign policy that says, I know that this is true when, in fact, this is not true, and we will build a policy based on it. That what about the candidates who, like, just don't know the name of the president of Turkmenistan? This is, like, the no, uh, it's you always know what? Republican I, candidates. Like, I, the gonna, gotcha. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to cut some slack. I, it's very interesting. You know, obviously, it's going to be the GOP side that's going to earn most of the Trumpy nominations until, you know, Joe Biden starts campaigning. Um, but... The the fact, you know, and so I got a lot of, you know, uh, criticism about this saying, well, what about when Barack Obama talked about the 58 states and so forth? You know, I, I'm, I'm 57. giving a, It was 57. 57, sorry. Right. And, and so, you know, I'm giving a pass for sort of just people who are tired. Like, Tim Pawlenty gave a, uh, you know, gave an answer about a, Iran, and it was very clear he thought he, he thought the question was about Iraq. Um, and then, you know, it, he was correct. He's like, no, I'm sorry, I meant Iraq. Um, and, you know, actually, the, the answer wasn't that bad as, as, as these things go. So, you know, floods like that and, and failing to know who the Turkmenistan president is, that, that's fine. I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to assume, you know, omniscience on this stuff. It's more pretending that you do know something when, in fact, you don't. That that I think is how you earn it in my book. Well, I, I, I hate to say this, but I think that there are going to be a lot of Trumpies handed out. I am looking forward. I, 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 maybe that'll be my drinking game tonight, you know, if, uh, to watch this, is to see uh, just who says the absolute stupidest thing. Uh, well, if so, I hope you're going to I hope you're going to uh, blog the, the the results. Yes, it's going to be. It's not going to be pretty. <laughs> and increasingly, like ha 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 ha. <laughs> Lol. I was saying it's going to be. I mean, you and I are going to experience some very drunk Twitter feeds tonight. I suspect. <laughs> um, so uh, that'll That's be the only way to get through it. Exactly. Um, well, we should uh, we should close by talking about uh, a sort of internet scandal du jour, and for once, we're not talking about Anthony Weiner. Um, which is there was a, 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 a scandal per se in that um, there was a, a blog based, ostensibly based, uh, done by a Syrian lesbian um, that's been up since February, you know, talking about the life of a, a, a Syrian le a lesbian, um, that has now been revealed to be, in fact, uh, the nom de guerre of a guy named Tom McMaster, who was an American, uh, getting a master's degree, I believe, in international relations somewhere in Scotland. Uh, he's, you know, because the, the blog claimed she, this woman had been arrested, at which point the press started reporting, oh, my God, this very famous Syrian blogger was arrested. And then everyone began to notice that they had never actually seen a picture of this person uh, and the pictures that had been uploaded it turned out to be, you know, uh, someone else. And at which point uh, the guy uh, then copped to it. And let me read what he said. Um... Uh, I never expected this level of attention. Uh, while the narrative voice may have been fictional, the facts on this blog are true and not misleading as to the situation on the ground. I do not believe I have harmed anyone. I feel that I have created an important voice uh, for issues that I feel strongly about. 
Um, this experience is sadly only confirm my feelings regarding the often superficial coverage of the Middle East and the pervasiveness of new forms of, I'm not making this up, liberal Orientalism. Uh, therefore, a nice shout out to Edward Said. Um, so, you know, this is just a the latest in a long series of things apparently not to do on the internet, uh, which is do not pretend to be a, a, a Syrian lesbian. I don't understand why people do things like this, and yet it's shockingly common. You know, what do you, what makes you think, like, what I should do is start a, a blog in which I pretend to be someone much sort of more unusual than I am? And it's not surprising to me that he, he tried, he arrested her, um, as it were, that, you know, my understanding of, of these sorts of things is that when they happen, usually what happens is that the person running the con um, kills the person off or attempts to, because it gets out of hand, right? Yeah, like yeah. people want to meet you, people, right. um, and maintaining it takes an enormous amount of effort. And so you, uh, you attempt to, um, you attempt to put them out of commission in a way that explains their decision to suddenly go offline. Well, all right. I, um, I mean, I would say two things. First, I will defend the occasional, uh, you know, use of this tactic. I mean, part of the problem is, is that it, not not this exactly, but I was thinking like, uh, um, I think one of the funniest things I've read in the last year was the fake Rahm Emanuel tweets. Did you ever? Did you read that feed? Oh, sure, but those were. I mean, like those. The, those were obviously fake, fake. Like being yeah. fake, fake Steve Jobs, etc. Right. Like those are hilarious. Yeah. But they're yeah. also clearly they're also clearly. No, but fake. it's the people who are doing it with an intent to deceive, right? right? This guy wanted people to think he was a Syrian lesbian. Yeah. Which um, he wasn't doing it to be. No, no, no. I think the fake impersonations are hilarious. Okay, all right. Totally so, so let's um, separating that. I mean, I suspect that what happens frequently is that people don't ever think that these things are ever going to blow up. Um, you know, in that that. I mean, I wonder if. I wonder if people do this with the notion that they don't really think that they're going to get quite the level of media scrutiny that they wind up getting. That's the only thing I can assume, um, because otherwise I don't get the motivation either. Um, in the, in the sense of the, the notion that this guy genuinely thought that, you know, by being exposed, he's just uncovered the superficial Western nature of, of the coverage of Middle East. You know, it does border on the delusional because, it, you know, I, I don't think he realizes the extent to which he's done damage to the very cause that he's ostensibly trying to promote, uh, which is presumably freedom for, you know, uh, 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 BGLU, you know, or, or uh, 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 however you want to put that community in, in Syria um, and in the Middle East because God knows they face real issues. I think, unfortunately, it's, it's even more problematic in the Middle East where there are very, very, very good reasons to be anonymous online. I mean, that's the other problem, right. complicating factor here, um, which is, you know, I think there are ways in which there, unfortunately, this is probably more likely to happen in places where you would understand the reason for anonymity um, than others. Well, I'm trying to think of, because there have been other examples of this, right? There have been quite a few. Of, of um, There was a alleged sex worker who, um, Yes. People started realizing they'd never met her, and that she didn't show up, and that like, um, and and ultimately, what's interesting is that they always end up. I don't, I'm not sure that the sex worker ever spoke about it, but the people who do things like this so often end up defending it on the grounds yeah. that um, they were somehow either victims of oppression. Or they were doing it for a good cause. Well, they were doing it for victims of oppression. That even if they yeah. weren't themselves, they were trying to highlight the the problem involved. I mean, I think about people like Jason Blair, yeah, right, yeah. who did enormous damage. First of all, like, you know, for a guy who's so concerned about how badly minorities were treated, like, he basically blew up the New York Times Affirmative Action Program. Right. Um, but also, like, it was it was pathological. It wasn't something he had to do because, you know, Stephen Glass did it, too, and he was, like, a privileged white kid from the suburbs. There's not... Um, the, the people who do this are, like, sociopaths. They're not people, the, the the qualities needed to keep abusing the trust of people, because if you think about the interactions he's having with people, and he's developing online friendships, and he's just abusing their trust. You know, I don't, right? I don't know if I would say, I don't know if I would say, you know, sociopath, if he demonstrates a, a, a sociopath. I mean, in some ways here, I think Stephen Glass is different than the rest of them. I mean, I think the better way to put it is these people are monomaniacal. In that, if they genuinely think there is an issue they care about, they don't. You know, it's it sort of the ends justify the means. So 
they're perfectly happy to subvert that, you know, to, to lie and do any you know, sort of other thing online if they feel like they're, they're promoting their cause. Um, which, of course, the, the problem, as you say, is that once they get out, it, it, they, clearly they've much more sabotaged their cause, um, done much more harm than, than any possible temporary benefit. I think the problem is, is that they, they, see, they only see the temporary benefit. But I, I, I have to say that I suspect that they enjoy it. Oh, yeah, I'm I sorry, do. yes, I yes. mean, I suspect that they enjoy yes. deceiving people, yeah. that they enjoy oh. the attention and yeah. the... Um, because almost no one does this, right? It would be very advantageous to do it, and yet few people do. Um, That's a good point. Okay. And, and like, to this extent, I mean, you have always have people concealing their motives, etc., but simply just pretending to be... Um, and, and completely deceiving people. And if you think about, you know, establishing an online friendship, because we knew each other, right? Like, like lots of bloggers, we knew each other online long before we met in, in person. Yeah. And if you think about all of the, in all of those interactions, which get quite personal and sort of you feel like you really know someone, to keep it up. Yeah. To yeah. keep up the, I mean, it's, it's a really high degree of deception of someone who's clearly a nice person who's trusting you. And the ability well, to do that I, I mean, what strikes it, me as... Um, not just, I mean, I, I don't think that they, that they, ju I mean, like, you know, a propaganda wing of a party or something would be different, but, but to just do freelance this on your own, I do suspect that they, that they do it in part because they like the, I mean, it, you know, yeah. and people do, right? Like I, mean, I used to, when I was in college, we would go into bars and make up ridiculous stories and like, um, and tell them to, because it was fun, but it was like basically also harmless. No what was your most there, ridiculous right? bar story? Um, it wasn't mine. I had a, oh, oh, my most ridiculous bar story was there was a guy who was hitting on me. Yeah. This was after college and I was meeting some colleagues and one of my colleagues was Irish and told this guy, because I was trying to get rid of him, told this guy that I was his cousin, that his Irish, you know, he was like, I was an Irish American and he was from Ireland. I was his cousin and then he had come over to facilitate my arranged marriage to someone I'd never met <laughs> and that we were meeting in this bar. <laughs> And this kid, like, his last name was, like, Kelly or something. I have no idea where he got the idea that arranged marriages were still common in Ireland. <laughs> but it went on and on, and he's trying to get me to, like, to, to you know, like, um, not go through with it. And he's trying to persuade me, and he's getting drunker. And I was like, no, I really can't. You know, it's the honor of my family. And then my, his uh, roommate showed up, and, like, he was like, and this is the guy. And, like, completely, I don't know how, picked it up from just that cue. Wow. I mean, this was before, like, texting or cell phones. That's so, that and was impressive. just like, and, and went through, and it, I now feel kind of bad about it. I mean, I now look back and I think, well, I was, um, that was sort of callous. On the other hand, like people who try to- Yeah, hold on. I got to stick up for guys who actually like have the courage to, you know, to, to hit on someone like you. So, you know, how dare you be that mean? Um, well, I, I tried to, I tried to get him to go away through more subtle means. Fair enough. And he was very persistent and would not leave in my defense. I don't know. I'm very um, proud. I, I never used any sort of deception like that in bars. This is mostly because I actually can honestly say I don't think I ever hit on a woman in a bar. <laughs> but but I recognize now that it was a terrible thing to do. I'm not going to defend it. It was, okay. it was mean. And, like, we shouldn't have done it. Um, on the other hand, we were drinking, and I was in a large group of people. <laughs> and w what people do, unfortunately, when they're drinking and in a large group of people is not, it's, you know, like, uh, boundaries broke, get broken down, etc. But I'm not going to defend this behavior. It was, and to do it, and also we didn't do it for months. I would have felt terrible if I had had this guy going for more than 20 minutes. I right, mean, right, like, right. Um, you know that, that would, and if you no, there's a difference me, between doing friends and yeah. like that's a level of again not defending what I did. Totally, I was a, I was a terrible, terrible 21 year old. Um, I probably should have been shot for my own good. Um, but there's a diff totally diff but lots of people do that. Lots of people do not get online and start. And as I now recall, the se that sex worker guy was basically using it to, um, get freebies from prostitutes that he allegedly met as a sex worker. Oh God. Like people who said they wanted to become sex workers, he they would be like, well, I have a client. He'll start you off. Um, yeah. he's a really nice guy, et cetera, et cetera. And it was this okay. guy who was impersonating the sex worker or a, a, I'm pretty sure that's how it sort of ended up being resolved. So, I mean, like terrible that was really especially abusive but in general i think someone who can maintain that for months is is enjoying it in some way that's really yeah. sad and unhealthy they're not just doing it for because it's a good cause and it, as you say it destroys the cause i mean it it just it, it it's like it's sort of like um michael Belial with arming america i oh, yeah, always yeah, wondered yeah. 
what he thought. Like, I mean, for those who don't know, this guy wrote a book are basically arguing that um, that uh, there were not no gu- there were virtually no guns in colonial America, and that right. the whole myth that the whole idea of American guns as being connected to American freedom was a myth. Um, and, and it's definitely he based this on a lot of uh, sort of probate records and will you know will and auction yeah. records, and which also where he to just be- made it up. I mean, like, and it was kind of extraordinary that he wasn't caught sooner because, for example, the the sort of really devastating table was all these probate records and the cells on the table did not add up. Mm. So if you looked at the totals on the sides and on at the bottom, they didn't so, you know, the, the cells on the table did not sum to those totals. Mm-hmm. So someone should have asked him to redo it just immediately that way. Um, but yeah, he just, he claimed to have access pro access probate records that have been destroyed in the 1906 San Francisco fire. He claimed, you know, his, the people who checked the probate records that did exist turned out to look nothing like what he claimed. Um, and it took years. I mean, literally the book was published in 90, the article, first article, which then became a book was published in 96 and he eventually went down, I think in 2003. Yeah, that sounds about right. For this. Yeah. But I've always wondered, like, I've always thought he must have not just thought that he was doing this for a good cause, or even to get tenure, he must have at some level enjoyed putting the deception over on people, because otherwise you would think it's, I mean, you're an academic, and you know what this would do to your career. If nothing else, how risky it is, right? Like, Yeah, yeah no, I, I there's, there's no denying that. I mean, I, I, that's something I honestly can't, I, I can't get into the, the mindset of why someone would do that. Um, so... I, I think it must be like, sorry, for me, like Stephen Glass, I can't even watch Shattered Glass because I'm so nervous about getting things wrong by accident, but the idea of doing it on purpose, like, yeah. it makes me so, um, I assume it's the same for academics contemplating the... Uh, right, no, that's, it's just something you just sort of shudder and walk away from. You don't ever want to, you know, uh, you don't ever want to think about that. Uh, the only, I mean, the only kind of, that, that, the only kind of thing I can see like that was was more like the Doris Kearns Goodwin case where... Right. You know, that, and, and that's a little different. That's, it's not that I ever want to do that, but now I can see how that happened because she's so busy and she relied so much on RAs that, you know, you, and in, in this world of cut and paste, I can see kind of how that happened. Um, and that's one of those things where, like, you know, I, I've now, I'm actually kind of glad that thing happened because it now makes me very, very wary when I'm writing to make sure that I don't do things like that. Um, but I, you know, I can see that happening to people. But that the Bly, the the, the Michael Bly thing is, is totally yeah. On a different yeah, I side. find myself doing it. Like I'll find myself not whole passages, but I will find myself accidentally, like re, especially when I'm blogging and I'm doing it quickly, I'll end up inserting a sentence mm-hmm. half an hour later that I read. You know, and I, I think I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. But then I, I look back at the article and I realize I've I've lifted it. Quote, I somehow yeah. remembered yeah. the whole sentence and have lifted it word for word, and then I have to go back and paraphrase. Yeah. And I'm always linking the article and so forth, so it's not quite the same thing. But um, it is easier to understand than just making stuff up, which is just to me incomprehensible. Um, you know, the plagiarists who get caught, the journalists who get caught plagiarizing. It's usually the difference. I think is that it's usually much worse when they get caught plagiarizing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, my understanding of Goodwin and Ambrose and those people was that they would have like in a whole book, they would have a paragraph or two at a time. Right. Whereas Sometimes you'll see journalists yeah. who have par- who have plagiarized like a much larger percentage. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. that's true. And that's just I understand they're under deadline, but yeah. there's just no excuse for that ever. Well, on that depressing note, uh, <laughs> I didn't get going, but as always, it was a pleasure, Megan. You know, I, I yes, you, you tweeted you tweeted last night that you know you're, you're uh, you know you you because uh, it was your first anniversary and and you know to your favorite husband. I hope I'm your favorite blogging news partner. That's the only. Reason. Oh, absolutely. Oh, thank you. I mean, I have to say only because I have never blogging heads from my husband. Right, exactly. But just, well, that's because he would be totally my second favorite blogging heads. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, All right, well, yes. I, will, uh, I will see you on Twitter tonight as we both get more and more drunk. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> until then, uh, farewell, Dan, and uh, farewell, Internet. All right, take care. Bye. Bye.